cool. Um, so I'm not sure like if one part of the test is or one chapter is like a lot harder than the other chapters this time. Um, so maybe we'll just go through the study guide in order. <clears throat> and whatever we don't get to today, we'll get to next. So starting with chapter 18, um, what's the difference between second and primary endosymbiosis? Or I guess first, what is primary endosymbiosis? Primary is when the bacteria engulfed by early eukaryotic cells and became mitochondria and chloroplast. And yes, perfect. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, right, so primary endosymbiosis happened <laughs> way long ago um, at the beginning of when eukaryotes were just, you know, starting to evolve. Um, you had these early eukaryotic cells take up bacteria, um, and then those bacteria, instead of dying, turned into mitochondria chloroplasts that were later inherited by all eukaryotes in the case of mitochondria and by GM plants in the case of chloroplasts. Um, and then what's secondary in synthesis? When eukaryotic algal cells were engulfed by larger eukaryotic cells and there became chloroplasts remaining? Yeah, right. <clears throat> So you've had a few secondary endosymbiotic events in um, the history of the evolution of eukaryotes. In each case, you had an algal cell, some type of algae, uh, that was swallowed up by a, another eukaryotic cell, um, some type of protist. And instead of the algal cell just completely degrading, only most of it degraded and the chloroplasts were left behind. Um, so you've had a few protists protists that have inherited chloroplasts in this way from algae. Um, so those protists actually are able to do photosynthesis since they have chloroplasts. So the main difference there would be in primary endosymbiosis have bacteria being engulfed by early eukaryotes leading to um, the origin of mitochondria and chloroplasts. In secondary endosymbiosis you have algae being engulfed by protists um, and the protist gains chloroplasts and therefore photosynthesis. Um, let's see, then we had six uh, eukaryotic supergroups that we talked about. What are those six supergroups? Um, Archaeplastida? Archaeplastida, yeah. And that's one of them. What type of organisms are found in Archaeopteryx? Uh, Rhizaria. Oh, Rhizaria? Yeah, definitely. That's another one. Opisthoconta? Opisthoconta? Yes. <laughs> the names are really weird. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But you're good. Don't worry about pronouncing it perfect. Actually, the truth is, for all of these, there's like multiple ways to pronounce it that are acceptable. So, no worries. Uh, amoebozoa. Amoebozoa. Uh, excavata. Excavata. Chromabiota. Okay. Uh, and chroma alveolata. Yeah, cool. Um, so in Archaeoplastida, what types of organisms do you have in there? If plants and red, red and green algae. Yeah, the plants and the red and green algae. Um, and then the red and green algae could also call just the true algae, since those are like the original algae. Either way. Um, actually on the test, I have the test here. It does say red and green <laughs> red and green algae on the test, so you're good with that. Um, then in Rhizaria, what types of organisms do you have in Rhizaria? Mm, protist. Protist, yeah, it's protist. Um, then in Opisiconta, what do you have in there? 
Animals and fungi? Animals and fungi, yeah. And then in Amoebozoa, what's in there? Amoebozoa, <coughs> protist? Protist again. And excavata? Uh, protist again. Also protist, yeah. And finally, chromalveolata. Protist and algae. Yeah, protist and algae. Um, and this time, it's not the red and green algae, it's the golden and the brown algae, which are also kind of like protists. Those are protists that had inherited um, chloroplasts from true algae by secondary endosymbiosis. Um, there's also other protists that got, you know, chloroplasts by secondary endosymbiosis, not just the golden and the brown algae. It's actually kind of just a historical accident that we refer to them as algae. Um, like in those groups, you have organisms that are multi-celled, so they're actually like big enough to see with your eyeball. <laughs> so um, scientists have been knowing about them for a long time and just kind of you know call them algae along with the other algae that they were aware of. Um, where the other protists that got photosynthesis, you can't see them with your eyes, so you know they just weren't discovered um, in time to be called algae. Um, not that that's on the test or nothing. <laughs> Okay, then the next thing we've got on here is the protist genera that have human pathogens. Um, there's six of them. What's one of them? Guardia. Giardia, yeah. Trichomonas. Trichomonas. Triponosoma. Trypanosoma. Pronunciations all over the place. <laughs> Plasmodium. The Plasmodium. Entamoeba. 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 Okay. Yeah. Oh, I only got five. Yeah, there's one more. Starts with a T. Toxoplasma. Plus. Toxoplasma. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so Giardia, Trichomonas, Trypanosoma, Plasmodium, Toxoplasma, and Entamoeba. Um, you actually have some people at UTEP who are studying like Giardia and Trypanosoma. <laughs> so that's kind of cute. Um, and then which types of protists are phototropes? I do photosynthesis. Euglenids? Euglenids? The euglenids, yeah. Dinoflagellates. Flagell <laughs> Dinoflagellates. And diatoms? Diatoms. And chlorarachneophytes. Chlorarachneophytes? It's like the weirdest one. <clears throat> and two more. Golden algae. Yep, the golden uh, golden algae. Mm -hmm. Is it also golden? I mean, brown, uh, brown algae. Yep, and the brown algae. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So the euglenids, dinoflagellates, yeah. diatoms, chlorarachneophytes. Golden algae and brown algae are all the protists that had inherited um, chloroplasts from algae, <clears throat> from kind of true algae by secondary endosymbiosis, and therefore gained photosynthesis. Um, and I guess we've kind of gone over it already, but what is the difference between true algae, which are the red and green algae, and then the brown and golden algae? So the true have chlorophyll, alpha and or bravo, and then the other one are unicellular? Let's see. So um, all of them can be unicellular. The brown and the golden are more likely to be like multicellular. Um, they do have like different pigments. Let me see if that's actually on the test.
Okay, yeah, you do not need to know the specific pigment differences for the test. Um, so what you would need to know is just uh, basically where they got their chloroplasts from and which ones are the true algae. So where did the red and green algae get their chloroplasts from? I'm not sure. I don't know. For sure. So for the red and green algae, those are the kind of true algae, and we call them that because they got their chloroplasts from primary endosymbiosis. So like way back <laughs> early in the development of eukaryotes, um, you had a cyanobacterium be engulfed by an early eukaryote um, and turn into a chloroplast. And then that eukaryotic cell that got that first chloroplast um, gave rise later on to the plants and the true algae, which are the red and the green algae. Um, so that's where the red and green algae got their uh, chloroplast from, from, uh, from cyanobacteria by primary endosymbiosis. What about for the, uh, the golden and the brown algae? Will it be the secondary? Yeah, the secondary endosymbiosis, exactly. Um, which means what type of organism uh, do their chloroplasts come from? Um. What, what, what was the question again? Oh. <laughs> What type of organism uh, did the chloroplast come from? Uh, the chloroplast that, that golden and brown algae have, mm -hmm. if they got it by secondary endosymbiosis. Phototrophs? Oh. Um, Sorry? Phototrophs? Phototrophs? Oh um, yes, some type of some type of eukaryotic phototroph. What type of eukaryotic phototroph would it have been? I'm not too sure. For sure. <clears throat> um, so it would have been either a plant or an algal cell. Um, since those are kind of the first eukaryotes to get chloroplast for cyanobacteria. So do you think it would have been a plant or an algae? Algae. Algae, exactly. Yeah, so for your golden and your brown algae, um, we're calling them algae, but actually they are protists. Um, they have gotten their chloroplast by secondary endosymbiosis. Um, where their ancestors engulfed uh, a true algal cell, either a red or a green algal cell. Um, actually, you know, a red one. <laughs> uh, and that's where they get their, their pigments from, or sorry, uh, their chloroplasts. 
So for the red and the green algae, those are like true algae. They're actually algae. They got their chloroplasts from primary endosymbiosis, which means that it ultimately came from a cyanobacterium. Uh, for the golden and the brown algae, we call them algae, but really they are protists. Um, they got their chloroplasts from proper algae, from the true algae, by secondary endosymbiosis. And that is basically what you would need to know about the difference between those. Um, so what's a frustule? It's a shell of the cell wall that remains after a diatom dies. Oh, uh, yes, yeah. Um, right, and so then a diatom would have it. <laughs> right, so a frustule is the cell wall of a diatom made out of silica. Um, since that's like a hard mineral, when the diatom dies, you still have the cell wall, and we call it a frustule then. Um, then what's a test? The hard calcified structures like shells? Yeah, it's similar to a, a shell, um, a calcified structure, so it has calcium carbonate in it um, surrounding the uh, organism, but like outside of its cell wall, so it's not actually the cell wall. Um, what type of organisms would have a test? Radiolarians? Radiolarians, yeah, and one more type. Foraminiferans? Um, yes. Foraminiferans, yeah, exactly. So the tusk is like a shell. The radiolarans and the foraminiferans have it. The frustule is a cell wall that's left behind when, the, when a diatome dies. And a diatome, of course, would have it. But technically not if it's still alive. Cool. How will it die? The diatome? Uh, <laughs> um, you know... Could be a lot of ways. I'm guessing, you know, it's just not going to get enough nutrients and that will cause it to die in some cases. Uh, but you can also have just, I guess, as cells are metabolizing, they're inevitably going to create um, reactive oxygen species. And that causes damage to the cell that persists through time. Um, and of course, cells are going to have ways to kind of mitigate that and detoxify the reactive oxygen species, but you can't detoxify everything. So cells are going to be sustaining little bits of DNA damage over time from the reactive oxygen species that they make as a result of their normal metabolism. And at some point, that will kill them. Um, so that's kind of part of aging in humans as well, just kind of, I guess, accumulated damage to our DNA um, and to our cellular structures that is coming from these reactive oxygen species. Um, so it could be that, so that's kind of like a normal old age type death. Uh, on the other hand, you could have kind of nutrients run low and then the diatome starves. Um, I'm sure you have some predators for diatomes, even though I don't know any specifically. Um, but actually you do have like, like whales and stuff, you know, they'll eat that. <laughs> so I do know some whales. <laughs> um, and apart from that, uh, you could just run into conditions where there's like toxins present in the water, uh, or if there's like not enough oxygen, then that'll do it as well. So I guess there's a number of ways for them to die. How will they leave behind the first jewel? How how do they leave it, leave it behind? Yes. So when the cell dies. Um, Everything in there can kind of be degraded, except for the frustule. The frustule is made out of silica. That's a hard mineral, so it's not going to be, like, broken that easy. I mean, you know, you could break it, but <laughs> uh, you would have to kind of, like, smash it or something to break it. It's not going to get broken kind of, like, by accident just floating around in the water. Um, then the, the contents of the cell can be eaten by other organisms. But it's pretty uncommon to have an organism that can eat silica or live off of silica. I actually don't know of any specifically that can. I'm not going to say it's impossible that there would be one, uh, but I don't know of any. Um, so it just kind of gets left behind as the result of being the part that no one else can eat. 
um, which is kind of the way that bones would be left behind. Like if, if an animal dies, the rest of it will get degraded or decomposed maybe by scavengers or by microorganisms. Uh, and then just the bones are left behind because very few things are able to actually eat bones. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Um, cool. Then we have amoeboid movement. <laughs> what is amoeboid movement? Cells stick out thick pseudopod and cytoplasm flows towards it. Yes, exactly. So um, depending on what type of organism we're talking about, the pseudopod might be thick or it might be thin, but in any case, it doesn't matter. You're going to have a pseudopod, a little extension of the cell membrane, kind of get stuck out, attached to a surface, and then the cytoplasm of the cell flows into the pseudopod. And when that happens, the whole cell ends up kind of rolling forward towards the pseudopod. And that is all you would need to know about that. Cool. What's a mycosis? There are diseases in humans caused by fungi, and they usually affect immunocompromised people. Yes, exactly. Right. A mycosis is any disease that's caused by a fungus, and they usually do affect immunocompromised people. Um, what types of people might be immunocompromised? Like cystic fibrosis. Um, like if they have diseases with their immune system or like damaged lungs. Yeah. Yeah. So anybody who has an immune system disease, an autoimmune disease, and that's, you know, I guess you could have like an immunodeficiency disease where your immune system actually doesn't work enough. It doesn't work right. <laughs> So that's that causes you to be immunocompromised. Or you could have an autoimmune disease where your immune system works fine, except for the little fact that it tends to attack your own tissues. Then you have to have like immunosuppressant drugs that you take uh, to save your tissues from your own immune system. And then you end up immunocompromised because of those drugs that you're on. Um, and then in addition to that, if you had lung damage, Technically, if you have lung damage, you're not immunocompromised just because you have a damaged lung, but it does mean that, you know, the lung is just kind of more vulnerable because it's already under stress, and that's a major entry point for fungi. So people who have lung disease, like cystic fibrosis, would also be at risk. Um, and then finally, um, I guess just mycoses are not common. <laughs> like, um, yeah, generally if you have a fungus that's going to cause disease in something, some type of organism, it wouldn't be in a person, wouldn't even be in an animal. It'll probably be in a plant. So mycoses are just not that common. Um, okay, then we've got all these vocab words for fungi. So what's a yeast? Single-celled fungi. Right, any single-celled fungus. What's a mold? Multicellular fungus. Yeah, yeah, any multi-celled fungus. What's a mycelium? Four filamentous masses for singular. Right, so for this would be for multi-celled uh, fungi. It's just kind of their body in a way, like all the cells together in a mass, and the cells would be arranged in filaments. So all these little filaments that they have together in a mass is the mycelium. Um, and then all those filaments, we would call them hyphae. What's, uh, what's a septate hyphae, or what are septate hyphae? They have cell walls dividing them into cells and it can be septate. Right, yeah. So for the septate hyphae, each cell is distinct. They're separated by cell walls. Then for the aseptate, or the synesthetic, there is no division in the cell walls. Um, or right. And they're more like a, yeah. a 
Plasmodium. More like a, oh yeah, more like a Plasmodium. Yeah, so those guys, you know, of course you have like the cell wall that's kind of on the outside of the hypha, like surrounding it, um, like a filament, but you don't have cell walls between the cells within the hypha, so you can't really tell where one cell ends and the next cell begins, which makes it more like a Plasmodium slime mold. Cool. Um, what are mycorrhizae? Structures of plant roots formed by symbiotic fungi. Yeah. Um, right, so just a kind of symbiotic relationship between fungi and the roots of a plant. Um, why do plants need mycorrhizae? Or why do they benefit from having mycorrhizae? It lets the it lets like the plant obtain nutrients. Yes, exactly. It helps the plant get nutrients from the soil. Um, makes it a lot easier for the plant to get nutrients from the soil that it's in. So, you know, technically plants can grow without the mycorrhizae, but they usually just don't. Um, I guess, you know, they certainly wouldn't choose to. Um, what's a lichen? Structures formed by symbiotic fungi and cyanobacterial algae. Yeah, so that's kind of like you sometimes hear them referred to as like composite organisms because to us it looks like an organism but really if you look closer there's multiple organisms in, inside of it and it's always a fungus and then some type of phototroph either a cyanobacterium or an algae um out of all the fungal phyla which which two are the best characterized The Basidio mycota and then the Philo. I don't know how to say it. Ascomycota? Yeah. Basidio mycota and Ascomycota. That's cool. You know, these words are all hard to say. <laughs> kind of on purpose, actually. Um, yeah, this whole kind of tradition of naming things using Latin started long after Latin was no longer spoken anywhere in the world. And it was literally like deliberate. Um, you know, you had these kind of early anatomists just basically get together and say like, we're going to name everything using Latin. And that way, if you're trying to be an anatomist, you'll have to learn from us and we'll always have jobs. And, and now it's just that way. Everybody does it that way. So now it's like the experts already know it using Latin words and they're not trying to learn new words. <laughs> So now we're all stuck learning Latin and trying to pronounce it. Um, so out of all those fungal phyla, which one has the mushrooms? The Basidiomycota. Basidiomycota. Cool. All right. So that's it for chapter 18. Now we get to do the viruses. So why do most scientists think that viruses are not alive? They have no metabolism, no protein synthesis, and no reproduction. Yeah, no metabolism, no reproduction. Um, usually when we say metabolism, we mean like reactions that you're doing to get energy. If we want to get technical, though, it's just all of the reactions, which would also include protein synthesis. Um, but yeah, no metabolic activity at all means no, no chemical reactions at all inside of a virus. So no way for them to make energy, no way for them to make proteins or any other cellular molecule or any other, I guess, organic molecule. And they cannot reproduce. So 
everything um, is coming from the host. Um, and you've got three basic parts of a virus, the capsid, the envelope, and the genome. What's the genome of a virus? Most variation of any microbe. All cellular life uses double-stranded DNA genome, and viral genomes are very small and can be single or double-stranded. Or, no, RNA or DNA, or in cases both, circular or yeah. linear, and slash or segmented, plus sense or minus sense. Yeah, so those are kind of the characteristics of viral genomes. They just have so many different formats that they can take. Um, what the genome actually is, is just the genetic material inside the virus. So basically the same as what a genome is for a cell. Um, but of course, the characteristics are very different from cellular genomes. Um, then what's a capsid? A coat of protein surrounding it. A capsid contains protein attached to those inside. And a capsid is a genome. A naked virus is right. Genome. Sorry? Uh, naked viruses have the capsid? Right, yeah. So actually all viruses will have a capsid, but naked viruses would have the capsid and then like nothing else outside of it. Um, all right, so the capsid is just that coat of proteins that is surrounding the genome. The most basic virus is nothing but that capsid, the protein coat containing the genome and then inside the genome. You might also have some enzymes inside of there depending on what virus it is but not all viruses are going to have like extra enzymes. And of course, even the ones that do, those enzymes are just sitting there doing absolutely nothing until the virus gets inside of a host. Um, then finally, we have the envelope. What is the envelope? The piece of host cell membrane that was stolen when the virion was released. Yeah. So that's a membrane around the virus outside of the capsid, and it would always be stolen from the host cell. A virus isn't going to like manufacture a membrane, so it has to take it from the host if it's going to have it. Um, so out of these three, uh, out of those three parts, the capsid, the envelope, and the genome, which is the part that not every virus is going to have? Is it the envelope? Yep, the envelope, yeah. Every virus must have a capsid and a genome or it's not a virus. Um, then you have enveloped viruses that have an envelope and naked viruses that don't have the envelope. Um, cool. What's the point of having an envelope? How does that help you as a virus? It, can, it contains the proteins needed to attach them. So that is true, but technically, if you didn't have the envelope, you would just have those proteins on your capsid instead. Whatever is like the outermost surface of the virus, that's where the virus is going to have the proteins that it needs to attach to the host cell. Um, so what's a benefit of having the envelope that you wouldn't have if you did not have the envelope? I guess making it harder for the immune system to detect. Yeah, makes it harder for the immune system to detect the envelope. And why does it make the immune uh, why does it make it harder for the virus to be detected if it has the envelope? Can you say that again? Sorry? Can you repeat it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, why is it harder for the host immune system to find the virus if the virus has an envelope?
Is it because the envelope is a piece of host cell membrane stolen when the Byron was released? That is why, yeah. So the, the, the envelope is coming from the host cell because it's stolen from the host cell, which means what does the envelope have in it that's from the host cell, apart from just, you know, the membrane itself? Proteins? Proteins, yeah. It has proteins from the host cell. So the host cell membrane is going to be studded with proteins. When the virus is stealing a little piece of it, the virus is going to put some viral proteins in there, and then it's just going to take the piece off, and that piece is going to have some host cell proteins on it too. So then the immune system comes by, it looks at all those proteins, it sees host cell proteins, and it says, those are mine, this must be mine, and then it doesn't respond. Or, you know, it just doesn't respond like as quickly, or you have that chance for the for the immune system to not really notice the viral proteins and only notice the host cell proteins. Um, yeah, so just the fact that this membrane has host cell proteins in it is what makes it really beneficial, makes it look like the host through the host's own immune system. Um, so that's the big benefit of having an envelope. What's the drawback of having an envelope? It makes the virus uh, fragile. Yeah, makes the virus fragile, exactly. Um, a membrane is easy to disrupt, and they're easy to break. Um, so if you have a capsid that's a protein shell, it's pretty hard to break it. Um, if you have an envelope, real easy to break it. Uh, if, if you just end up somewhere that's too hot, it's going to get broken. Um, if you end up somewhere that has <laughs> soap, that's going to get destroyed. And there's a lot um, of compounds actually that can destroy a membrane, like alcohol also would destroy a cell membrane or a viral envelope. So um, yeah, it just means you're vulnerable to having that membrane degraded. What happens if the envelope is degraded? Well, now your surface, surface proteins are gone that you needed to attach to the host cell. So if you're a naked virus and you have those proteins on your capsid, it's hard to break a capsid. So you're very hardy. If you're an enveloped virus, you have those proteins for attachment on the envelope, which is easy to degrade. And then once you've lost it, you don't have the proteins that you need to attach to the host. Now you're just basically an inert particle that will never do anything ever again. Yeah, so that's the drawback of having an envelope. <laughs> Um, and then the next one, I guess we've already kind of been talking about, um, but how do viruses attach to host cells? Through the proteins on the envelope? Through the proteins that are on the envelope, or where else could those proteins be if you're a naked virus? The answer that I put was um, they steal energy from the host cell and force host to replicate them. So that's going to be once they get inside the host cell. Once they, once they get inside the host, they will steal energy from the host and force the host to replicate them. Um, but before that, they have to attach. They have to have something on their surface, something on their outermost surface that will let them attach. It could be on the envelope. It's a surface protein. <laughs> it, 
if you're an envelope virus, you would have that on the envelope. If you're a naked virus, you don't have an envelope. So you put your surface proteins where? Is it the envelope protein? Well, if you have an envelope, then you would have envelope proteins that would be, you know, for attaching to the host cell. Yeah, definitely. If you're a naked virus and you don't have an envelope, where would you have those proteins at? At the flagellum. Let's see. So you might they they might be uh, proteins that will attach to the flagellum of your host cell. A virus isn't going to have a flagellum though, or a flagellum. Um, but yeah, some of those surface proteins might be looking for a flagellum to attach to it. Um, but where would those proteins be on the virus if the virus does not have an envelope? The capsid? The capsid, yeah, exactly. So the surface proteins will always be on the outermost surface <laughs> of the virus. If you're a naked virus, that means the capsid. If you're an enveloped virus, that means the envelope. In either case, you're going to have a protein somewhere on your outermost surface that is able to grab something on the host cell. Um, so if you don't have that protein, if that protein gets destroyed, then it doesn't matter what else the virus has. It's impossible for it to attach to the host cell, which means it's impossible for it to get inside the host cell and infect it. The surface protein is key. And then that takes us to sense. <laughs> what is plus sense? The sequence of bases in the strand that corresponds to mRNA. And then. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So plus sense means the sequence of bases is the same as mRNA, which means that. If you have that sequence of bases and it's RNA format, you could just feed that into a ribosome and it'll build a protein for you that is the right protein. Um, then what's minus sense? So the bases of strand that is complementary to mRNA? Right. The bases aren't the same as the mRNA. They are complementary to mRNA, which means that if you had that in RNA format and you fed it into a ribosome, would you get the right protein out? No. No, right. It would be a totally different protein. But you could take that minus sense strand and use it to build an actual mRNA strand that could be read by the ribosome. So if you're plus sense and your RNA, you're ready to go and get made into a protein. If you're minus sense and your RNA, you're ready to be used as a template to build the actual plus sense strand that could be read by the ribosome. Same thing if you're minus sense in your DNA, actually. But yeah, on a basic level, plus sense, same sequence as mRNA, minus sense, complementary sequence to mRNA. Um, what are the steps in the lytic viral life cycle? life cycle. You have the attachment, penetration, First attachment. penetration. Uh, synthesis, synthesis, assembly, and then release. Assembly and release. Cool. All right. So attachment, penetration, synthesis, assembly, release. What happens in attachment? Um. The virion binds to host cell using protein on its capsid or envelope. Right, exactly. In the attachment phase, the virus needs to grab the host cell using its surface proteins. If it's a naked virus, those proteins are on the capsid. If it's an enveloped virus, those proteins are on the envelope. Um, so first, it grabs the virus. Oh, sorry, grabs the host cell in attachment. Then, in penetration, what happens? The virion is taken into the cell uh, or injects its genome enzyme into cell. 
Yeah, exactly. So either the virus will enter that host cell or else it'll just inject its contents, which would be its genome. So either the whole virus or just the genome would be entering the host cell in penetration. Then you have synthesis. What happens there? The host cell replicates viral genome and uses it to make viral proteins, especially for capsaicin. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So now you're making new copies of the viral genome, and the host cell is going to be building viral proteins. So now is when the virus is kind of forcing the host cell to do its bidding and build all of those viral proteins and possibly its genome as well. Um, and of course, the number one protein that needs to be built is the protein that the capsid is made out of. You need a lot of it. Um, and then after synthesis, after you've built everything that you need, then assembly. What happens in assembly? You the buy new particles. particles assemble together. Right. Then you have to actually assemble all those components into new viral particles. So all those capsid proteins are snapping together to make a capsid, and then you're stuffing the genome inside of there, making a bunch of new viral particles. Then finally, release. What happens in release? The viral particles, they exit the cell, and then the cell lyses. Yes. So now you have your viral particles leaving the cell. So we call them virions again now. Um, but actually, I won't mess you up by like putting virion when it's not a virion. <laughs> um, so the viral particles exit the host cell. And usually, that host cell is going to die. It's going to be lysed and broken open, and it'll die. Cool. That's the lytic cycle. What are the steps for the lysogenic cycle? The first two are the same. Yeah. So the first one would be what? Attachment. Attachment, yeah. And then penetration. Yeah, so the first two, the same as the lytic cycle, attachment and penetration. Then what happens next? We have the lysogenic integration. Lysogenic integration, yeah. And what's after that? The lysogenic maintenance. Lysogenic maintenance, yeah. And after that? Induction. Induction, cool. And then how does it finish? Uh, the same as that one, so synthesis, assembly, and release. Yeah, exactly. So we start with the lytic cycle, attachment and penetration. Then we enter different steps, the lysogenic integration, lysogenic maintenance, and induction. And then it's back to the lytic cycle for synthesis, assembly, and release. Um, so for those steps, other than just knowing the order that they go in, um, you would just need to know what happens in the three steps that are unique to the lysogenic cycle. So what happens during lysogenic integration? The viral genome remains inactive. And then it's integrated, either integrated or not integrated, the chromosome. Yeah. So, right, in the lysogenic integration, instead of the viral genome kind of becoming active, being replicated, used to make proteins, instead of that, it goes dormant um, and it's inactivated. Um, there's a couple different ways that it could, uh, that it could like exist in its dormant state. It might be integrated into the chromosome of the host cell or it might not be, either way. Um, and then what happens in lysogenic maintenance? The latent viral genome stays dormant by various mechanisms. Yeah, right. So basically, in a way, nothing happens. The genome is just sitting there. It remains dormant. Um, then what happens in lysogenic integration? Oh, uh, sorry. In, I mean, in induction. <laughs> It's activated. The latent virome gets activated. Yeah. So there, your dormant genome, it becomes activated. Um, and now that it's active, after that, you're going to re-enter the lytic cycle. Cool. So in integration, you are inactivating that genome. 
and either incorporating it into the host chromosome or not. In maintenance, you're just keeping it inactive. In induction, you're activating it again. And finally, what is reverse transcription? Making DNA using the RNA template? Yes, exactly. Um, so in transcription, you use DNA to make RNA. In reverse transcription, you use RNA to make D. Cool. Now for chapter 10 and the Baltimore scheme. <laughs> what, is the, uh, what is the Baltimore scheme based on? Uh, genome format? Yeah, like how genome they format. get the genes into mRNA format and how they replicate the genomes? Yeah, so you have the genome, genome format, how they are making mRNA using their genome, and how they are replicating their genome. Um, so the second two things are like really heavily influenced by the format that the genome starts off in. Um, so basically the most important thing would be genome format, but then all, after that you also have like how are they getting that genome to look like mRNA for the host cell and how are they making more copies of the genome. So that's different from like other organisms that we've talked about where their classification is based on evolutionary relationships. So far, it's just way too hard for us to figure out the evolutionary relationships between viruses, which means that we do not use that <laughs> to classify them. Um, and then you just need to know the different classes as far as uh, like what genome format each class has. Um, so what is the genome format for group one or class one? Double stranded DNA. Double stranded DNA, yeah. Then group two? Single stranded DNA. Single stranded DNA. Group three? Double stranded RNA. Double stranded RNA, yeah. And group four? Plus sense single stranded RNA. Yeah, your plus sense single stranded RNA. Group five? The minus, minus sense, sense single stranded RNA. Yeah, your minus sense single stranded RNA. And then the last two are the weird ones. What's group six? Plus the plus sense RNA retrovirus. The rust transcribe. Yeah. yeah, so that's your plus sense, that's your retroviruses plus sense single stranded RNA, and then we add the dash RT to mark that they are the retroviruses. And then final group seven. The DNA retroviruses. Yeah, DNA retroviruses. Um, what type of format is their genome in? The group seven? Yeah. Uh, double stranded? I don't know. Yeah, double stranded DNA, which is like <laughs> almost a trick question in a way because it's kind of, <laughs> it's like it's incompletely double stranded. It's not a whole complete like two strands. It's like one complete strand and then most of a second strand. So it's not fully double stranded, but we just call it double stranded. <laughs> Um, so for, for these guys on the test, I have like the abbreviations for the genome formats. So for group one, that would be DSDNA, group two, SSDNA, the like group four is plus SSRNA, and so on. Um, so then for group six, that's plus SSRNA-RT, and for group seven, the DNA retroviruses, that's DSDNA-RT. Um, cool. What is a retrovirus? I'm sorry, can you go back? To, like, can you explain that? Yeah. I'm getting confused. For the, um, the abbreviations or for? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That part. Okay, cool. So let's just go through all of them. Um, so for group one, the abbreviation, well, that's a, <laughs> group one has, um, double-stranded DNA, um, viruses. So we abbreviate that as DSDNA, the DNA for, you know, DNA. 
and then the ds means double stranded. So it's like a lowercase d, a lowercase s, and then capitalized DNA. Then group two is single stranded DNA, um, and we're abbreviating the single stranded as like SS or lowercase SS. So that's SS DNA for group two. Then for group three, um, now we start having RNA viruses. Group three is double stranded RNA viruses, and again, we're using DS to abbreviate double stranded. So group three is DS RNA. Then group four and group five, those are the single stranded RNA viruses. Um, group four is plus sense, group five minus sense. So for the sense, um, we're using a plus sign or a minus sign to indicate that it's plus sense or minus sense. So for group four, that's plus SS RNA for plus sense single stranded RNA. Group five is um, minus SS RNA or like a minus sign <laughs> SS RNA. Um, yeah. Then for group six, th those are also plus and single stranded RNA viruses, uh, but they're also, you know, the retroviruses that use reverse transcription. So we start out with the same abbreviation that we use for group four, the other plus and single stranded RNA viruses. So you have your plus SS RNA. And then because they do reverse transcription, we add on the dash RT um, in, in caps. To, to mark that they do reverse transcription. And then finally for group seven, those are double-stranded uh, DNA viruses that also do reverse transcription. So we abbreviate it as DSDNA-RT. Okay, got it. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. Um, cool. What's a uh, retrovirus? A virus whose RNA genome is replicated replicated via DNA intermediate. Right. So you have a virus that has an RNA genome, um, and instead of making uh, new copies of that genome using the existing RNA genome as a template. It's going to first make like a DNA copy of the genome, and then it's going to reverse transcribe <laughs> new copies of the RNA genome based on that DNA template. So when it gets into the cell, first it's going to make DNA copies of its genome. Um, and then later on, it's going to use those DNA copies to make more actual RNA copies of its original genome uh, using reverse transcription. Um, then there's something else that the retroviruses do with that DNA copy of their genome, other than just reverse transcribing it. They, they put it somewhere. Where do they put it? Or they integrate it somewhere. In the host genome? Yeah, in the host cell genome, yeah. So they're actually going to take that DNA copy of their genome and insert it right into the host cell chromosome. And there it waits. Um, so they're basically following a lysogenic life cycle. Um, it's like slightly slightly modified from the proper like lysogenic series of steps because, you know, um, when they get into the host cell, they don't immediately become inactivated. Instead, they make that DNA copy of their genome. Then the, that copy is going to be integrated into the host cell chromosome and be inactivated and just sit there and wait until it's induced and becomes active again. Once it becomes active again, they cut it out of the host cell chromosome and start using it to make new copies of their actual RNA genome by reverse transcription. So, um, so they're doing the two things. They're reverse transcribing new copies of their genome from a DNA intermediate and they are integrating that DNA intermediate into the genome of the host cell. Then finally, the last thing you would need to know is what reverse transcriptase does. The retroviral enzyme can produce DNA from an RNA template? 
Other way around. It produces RNA from the DNA template. Wait, no wait. Okay. Yes, no, that's right. <laughs> wait, is that right? Yeah, because the transcription is DNA. Wait. I've got so confused. <laughs> no, it's not right. I think Victor was right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that, Victor. Um, right, so in transcription, you have DNA, you go to RNA. <laughs> in reverse transcription, you have RNA, you go to DNA. Um, so I think I've been saying it wrong for a minute, actually. I'm so sorry, you guys. <laughs> um, right. Reverse transcriptase is the enzyme that is actually doing reverse transcription. So that means that it's, actually, it's the one that's building the DNA copy. There we go. Um, right. So you have your viral genome enter the cell. It's RNA. You're going to have reverse transcriptase reverse transcribe that to DNA, making a DNA copy. Then that DNA copy gets integrated into the host cell genome. And then later on, you're going to cut it out and use it to make uh, new RNA copies by regular transcription. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, that's the way it works. Um, OK, so just to reiterate that, I am sorry, you guys. I said it wrong so many times. Um, yeah, just to reiterate, you start with an RNA genome. You reverse transcribe to DNA using the enzyme reverse transcriptase. Now your DNA copy will be inserted into the host cell genome, and later on it will be used to make new RNA copies using regular transcription. Okay. Um, then we have viruses and cancer. There's two types of viruses that usually cause cancer. I guess if a virus is going to cause cancer, it's usually one of these two types of viruses. Um, so what, what type of viruses are more likely to be leading to cancer? HPV. HPV. HPV, yes. So that's an example of one of those specific viruses that causes cancer. Um, what type of genome does HPV have? DNA or RNA? DNA. DNA, exactly, yeah. So not just HPV, but DNA viruses in general are more likely to cause cancer than RNA viruses. Um, not every DNA virus causes cancer, of course. Only some of them do. But it's pretty uncommon to have an RNA virus that causes cancer unless it's that special type of RNA virus, the retrovirus. Um, so for the DNA viruses, why is it that they're uh, more likely to cause cancer than an RNA virus? Because the DNA polymerase replicates, replicates the genome? Right. Um, right. So for DNA viruses, it's the host cell DNA polymerase that will replicate the genome. Um, they're able to just use the host cell polymerase. If you're an RNA virus, um, the vast majority of host cells do not have any way to use RNA as a template to make more RNA. So that means that you need to have your own special enzyme to do that for you, um, which means that you don't need the host cell enzymes to do it. Uh, if you're a DNA virus, you, you are going to use the host cell enzyme, the host cell DNA polymerases, to replicate your genome. And a host cell is only going to even be making that type of polymerase if it's actively going through the cell cycle. So DNA viruses um, have kind of uh, an interest uh, in forcing their host cell to go through the cell cycle so that they're going to have that polymerase that they need to replicate the DNA virus genome. Um, and of course, a cell that's going through the cell cycle when it ought to not be going through the cell cycle, that's a cell that's kind of looking a little bit like a cancer cell. Um, that's a cell that is more likely to become cancerous. So it's really common for a DNA virus to make like a wart 
which is like an accumulation of extra cells that have been birthed because, you know, these infected cells are going through the cell cycle when they shouldn't be. Um, it's less common for a DNA virus to actually cause cancer, but some of them do. And, you know, a prime example would be HP HPV, which is always going to cause some type of wart, um, usually a genital wart, and sometimes it could also advance to actual cancer. Um, yes, yeah, so that's the DNA viruses. Then you have retroviruses that also are more likely to cause cancer than other types of viruses. Why do retroviruses cause cancer? Uh, is it because they insert into the host chromosome as well? Yeah, exactly. Because they usually are going to insert um, the DNA copy of their genome into the host cell chromosome. And that's kind of a random process. They don't really control where it inserts. Maybe it inserts right in the middle of a gene. Then that gene is kind of lost to the cell. Um, if that gene was something that the cell needed to control cell cycle progression or to control apoptosis, now maybe the cell can't enter apoptosis, or now maybe the cell can't control its cell cycle progression. Both of those would be hallmarks of a cancer cell. So, um, so yeah, <laughs> so the DNA viruses and the retroviruses would be more likely to cause cancer for those reasons. For the DNA virus, because they're using a host cell polymerase that will only be there if the host cell is in the cell cycle, and for the retroviruses, because they're going to stick their genome right in the middle of the host genome, and maybe they're going to get in the middle of a gene that the cell needed to not be a cancer cell. Uh, cool. So then, then, then we have viral evolution. Roughly when did viruses evolve compared to, I guess, other organisms? Maybe before Luca? Yeah, probably before Luca. So before you had proper prokaryotes and eukaryotes, you probably already had viruses. And what's the oldest type of virus? Group 3, double-stranded RNA. Yeah, right. The RNA viruses are the oldest, which is another reason why we think they might have evolved so early. Um, they might have evolved during the RNA world, since RNA viruses are the oldest ones. Cool. And then, how how is it the viruses speed up the organism? Uh, bleh, how is it the viruses speed up the evolution of other organisms? Some RNA viruses used to get DNA genomes. So it's possible that viruses had a role to play in, um, in cells in general getting a DNA genome. If you would have had like RNA viruses that then evolved enzymes that they needed to build DNA and reverse transcriptase, then they could have built, you know, they could have built DNA genomes and then transferred those to cells. Um, you actually don't need to know kind of all those hypotheses about how viruses might have contributed to the early evolution of, um, of proper cells um, or of DNA genomes in general. It's actually, this is something that, that could have happened back then, but it's also happened like since then, like for surezies. 
Is it the horizontal gene transfer thing? Yep, the horizontal gene transfer, yeah. Viruses are a major, I guess, vehicle for horizontal gene transfer. Um, it's not incredibly uncommon <laughs> for them to kind of accidentally pick up a bit of host cell DNA and package it into a new viral particle, thinking that that is part of their own genome, and then deliver that host cell DNA to the next host cell that they encounter. Um, so that is that is basically the only way that eukaryotes can have horizontal gene transfer, and it's also a major way for prokaryotes to have horizontal gene transfer. Cool. Then we have CRISPR. Um, how does CRISPR work? I guess if you have a virus infecting a prokaryote, um, what's going to happen to the viral genome that that involves CRISPR? CRISPR segments are transcribed to CRRNA. Right. So. If you have these CRISPR spacers already in the host cell genome, um, you're going to transcribe them to RNA, which would be CRRNA. Um, then what happens with those CRRNA segments? They base pair with the viral DNA. Right. They're going to base pair with a viral DNA. Um, if you have like if you have a virus infecting the cell that um, that these uh, CRISPR spacers had been based on, then then the CRRNA will be complementary to the viral DNA and can base pair with it. And then what type of protein is going to come and associate with the CRRNA? The Cas proteins. Cas proteins, yeah. Um, so you have your CRRNA base pairing with viral DNA. Then you have Cas proteins attaching to the CRRNA, and what happens next? They insert fragments into genome. So um, back at like <laughs> back at the beginning, the beginning, the very first time that this host cell or one of its ancestors is being infected with this type of virus, those Cas proteins are going to be yeah they're going to be cutting out chunks of its genome and inserting them into the host cell genome where they're going to become CRISPR spacers. Then later on, if the same virus infects that host cell, um, you're going to have those CRISPR spacers transcribed into CRRNA. The CRRNA bits will base pair with the viral uh, with the viral DNA, and Cas proteins will come and attach to them. Um, and this time, they're going to do something else to to the viral DNA. Well, they're going to cut it again, but they're not going to insert it into the host cell chromosome. Um, this time, when they cut it, what will happen to it? It becomes immune. I don't know. Well, the yeah, the the host cell is basically going to be immune to this to the specific virus. Um, and the way that the immunity kind of works is that once a like a new virus comes that I guess is the same as a virus that had infected that cell in the past, then you have your cRNA and your Cas proteins attaching to it, and the cRNA base pairs with this new viral DNA. And the cast proteins are going to cut it and just chop it up into little bits and destroy it. Um, then once all that viral uh, DNA is destroyed, now you don't have any viral infection anymore, basically. So 
So I guess the whole kind of sequence of events that would occur for this immunity to work um, would be first, the cell is going to get infected with a virus that it has not been infected with in the past. You're going to have cast proteins um, locating the new, the new viral DNA and cutting little chunks out of it. Those chunks are going to be inserted into the host cell chromosome um, where they become CRISPR spacers. Then uh, those CRISPR spacers will be used to transcribe little bits of RNA, which are CRRNA. So the host cell would actually kind of always have these little bits of CRRNA floating around in it, um, uh, you know, that have come from the CRISPR spacers, that have come from all the viruses that infected the cell in the past, or that infected one of its ancestors. Um, then if you have a new virus come and infect the cell, and it's the same type of virus as a type that had infected the cell in the past, now you have these little CRRNA bits that are complementary to this new virus's DNA, so they're going to base pair with it. Cas proteins will come, find them, and attach to them. Uh, now they've kind of located that viral DNA, and they will chop it into little bits and completely destroy it before this new virus even has a chance to like replicate its genome or do anything inside the host cell. Which means that functionally this host cell is immune to, to that virus and to any virus that it has a CRISPR spacer for. So CAS comes, like first you get this viral infection, CAS comes, cuts out segments of viral DNA, puts them as CRISPR segments into the host chromosome, those segments uh, are used to make CRRNA, which then attaches to Cas pro proteins, which finds viral DNA from a new infection and chops it up. And then the cell is immune. Cool. Um, so we've only got a couple little things left here. What is, what is a subviral agent? Infectious particles that is simpler than virus? Yeah. Any infectious particle that is simpler than a virus is counting as a subviral agent. Um, so that means that a virus is going to have at least a capsid and a genome that can carry out either the lytic cycle or the lysogenic cycle. A subviral agent is going to be missing something. Maybe it misses the capsid. You know, maybe it misses the genome, maybe it's missing certain pieces from the genome, like certain genes that it would need to successfully do a lytic cycle or a lysogenic cycle. It's missing something. Um, but it is still infectious. <laughs> it still has enough to get by some way, somehow. And then out of those subviral agents, there's only one type that you need to know for the test, which is the prion. Well, what is a prion? It's a misfolded protein that could make other proteins misfold as well. Right. A misfolded protein that can cause proteins around it to misfold in the same way. Um, and then I guess the only detail to add there would be that these new proteins that are going to be misfolding, they have to be the same type as the original prion protein. So the prion um, isn't going to just make every single protein around it misfold. It'll only be proteins that are of the same type. They will misfold to make the same shape as what the prion has. Uh, so in that sense, they're infectious. And what type of disease would a prion cause? Uh, transmittable spongiform, like encephal, Encephalopathies. Yes. Transmiss spongiform encephalopathies. Yes. So basically disease that affects the brain, it can be transmitted and makes the brain look spongy or take on the form of a sponge. Um, okay, cool. <laughs> so that's it for chapter 10. We just have chapter 20 left, but we'll get to that next time because you guys haven't even had a chance to look at that yet. Um, is, there, is, there, is there anything in here that you would like to go over again or that you have more questions on? What was the subviral agent again? Subviral agent. Basically, some, well, yeah, just something that is simpler than a virus but can still infect host cells. Um, so 
In the case of like a viroid, you don't have the capsid, you only have a little bit of RNA. Um, in the case of a prion, you don't have a genome, you just have like literally a protein that can make others misfold. Um, and you also have other ones as well. There's actually a bunch of different types. Um, of course, not be on the test, but you know, there, there's a lot that are like um, basically like viruses that have lost some of the genes that they need to have to actually do a successful infection. So then um, in order to infect the host cell, they kind of need another virus that's actually a real intact virus to infect the host cell at the same time. Um, there's actually some, I forgot which hepatitis virus exactly. Is it hepatitis D? I want to say it's hepatitis D. Um, is actually a subviral agent. It's not able to infect a host cell by itself. It has to have another virus come and help it. Uh, so a subviral agent, just simpler than a virus, but can still cause an infection. Okay. So the envelope came from the host cell? Yes, the envelope is always coming from the host cell. Okay. Which means that Thank it's going to have the host cell proteins on it. Help that virus evade the immune system. And I missed uh, one of the questions that you went over on chapter eight. It was the one that says, where does a viral envelope come from? And like, how does a viral get its envelope? I missed that one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the viral envelope is coming from the host cell. So when your viral particles are going to kind of emerge from the host cell, if they're if it's an enveloped virus, then as they're coming out, they kind of bulge out through the cell membrane and like, well, they make the actual cell membrane bulge out and they just like kind of chop off a little piece of it and wrap it around themselves and go about their way. So they're actually stealing little chunks of the host cell membrane as they come off of the host cell. Um, they would also kind of, they would have like, like pre-prepared the little pad that are going to come out of. They're going to like sell proteins onto it. So those surface proteins that they have to have to attach to a host cell, um, they're going to insert those proteins onto the host cell membrane. And then they're going to come out of the host cell right from that little patch that has the viral proteins on it wrapping the host cell membrane pieces around them as they emerge. So then they end up with this little, little bit of host cell membrane that has viral proteins on it and it has host cell proteins on it. And then because it has host cell proteins on it, when the immune system comes by, the immune system looks and it sees host cell proteins and it says, everything's fine here, I guess. Okay. Anyone else have have more questions? I don't. Cool. When do you upload the video? If, when are you going to upload it? Should be tomorrow. <laughs> It'll usually take a, like a while for uh, Blackboard system to kind of process it so that I can download it. And then I just have to remember to do it tomorrow. <laughs> okay. So if you're like looking for it and you're like, what? Email me. <laughs> I probably forgot. Just email me. <laughs> okay, got it. <laughs> All righty. So if no one has any more questions, then I'm going to call it a night. Um, thank you for coming, you guys. I hope it was helpful.
It was. Thank, thank you. you. Sweet. Thank you. And I hope you guys have a good night.